Today, we have the pleasure of having a guest speaker. Carol W. Smith is our speaker today. She is an independent curator and archivist who has worked with the Christchurch Archive since 2005 when she was hired to create a digital archives website. Since then, the website Christchurch.org, through her efforts, has been made available through, to the public a wealth of information about the history, records, and precious artifacts of that 325-year-old national treasure. She has worked to create exhibits, oversee the move and expansion of the archives, undertake an oral history program, oversee conservation treatment of artifacts and archival holdings, and increase digital access to materials. So one of the things that she's worked with is also digitizing. So I'm going to let her talk a little bit more about all of that, but I will say that she has a BA in American Civilization and an MA in Material Culture from the University of Pennsylvania in American Civilization and is a certified archivist. So we are delighted to have Carol here today. So thank you, Carol. I will let you begin. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me uh, join you tonight and tell you all about this really exciting project. So I'm going to pull it up. So again, this has been a five-year project, um, more than we anticipated, but we are so grateful with the way that it has turned out. This is a clear hidden collections project. The Council for Library and Information Resources, which is funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, to digitize the records of some of Philadelphia's oldest congregations. You can see by this view of the East Prospect of the city of Philadelphia done in the mid 18th century, that the city of Philadelphia was a small town, but even then steeples were dotting the landscape. Christ Church is number one here, the tallest building in North America until 1848. First Presbyterian Church is number four and the Dutch Church is number five. Soon to come was St. George's United Methodist Church, St. Paul's and St. Peter's. Gloria Dei, the Swedish Church, Swedish Lutheran is south of this image in what was then Wekako. The project includes the records of these older congregations minus the Dutch Church, as well as the second and third Presbyterian churches, Congregation Mikvah Israel, the African Episcopal Church of St. Thomas, and uh, First Baptist Church. Most of these records are still held by their original creating congregations. All, with the exception of St. Paul's, are still active congregations, although First and Second Presbyterian churches have since merged. The records of the First Baptist Church are now held by the American Baptist Historical Society in Atlanta, and the Presbyterian records are all at the Presbyterian Historical Society in Philadelphia. St. Paul's records and the founding minutes of the Episcopal Church are housed at the Episcopal Diocesan Archives, also in Philadelphia. So a little bit of background for this project. Christ Church, which you're seeing here, is the first Anglican church to have been established in Pennsylvania, and it was long the church for many worshipers in the city, and for a number of years, the nation. Members of the Continental Congress worshiped here, as did members of the federal government when it was headquartered in Philadelphia. Its archives have been carefully preserved over the years by generations of really dedicated volunteers. I began at Christ Church in 2005 to begin a digital archives. We started by putting our collections online through Past Perfect. And you can see here some of the links that you can access through ChristChurchPhila.org to get to some of those collections. We also began to enter our baptismal, marriage, and burial registers into an access database, working from those old WPA registers, which many of you have no doubt used, a project that was created by the government during the throes of the Great Depression. We later received funding from the Pew Charitable Trust to expand this work by scanning and placing online the first three volumes of the Christchurch Vestry Minutes and continuing that compilation of the de database of baptismal, marriage, and burial records through 1900. But I still wanted to get the original records online. 
Many researchers wanted to see the original documents, hereditary organizations such as the Colonial Dames, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the Sons of the American Revolution, and others often required copies of them for membership. So when I first learned of a digitizing hidden collections clear funded project to scan congregational records in New England, it struck me that Philadelphia's rich diversity of religions really lent itself to this type of project. CLEAR's focus in recent years has been to uncover hidden collections and make them accessible, initially through surveys and finding aids, now through digitization. These early religious records were truly hidden and it seemed like a perfect fit for CLEAR funding. Best of all, these projects were fully funded, no need for matches, which given that a number of small congregations were taking part was really essential. We just couldn't come up with those types of funds. So we contacted a number of old congregations within the historic sections of the city that were established prior to 1800, sent out letters and called together those who accepted our invitation. The collaboration was important in that these smaller congregations don't have the ability to apply for these large grants on their own. And also because while all the records are important as a body, they're even more compelling when you see them in conjunction with each other. So using existing partners for that earlier Christchurch pilot project, the scanning of the vestry minutes, the Athenaeum of Philadelphia's Regional Digital Imaging Center had done that scanning, and Walter Rice was our IT consultant on that project. We applied unsuccessfully to CLEAR in 2016, but we were heartened by the feedback we got, and so we strengthened our proposal talked to some other people, added two more congregations, the First Baptist Church and St. Thomas's African Episcopal. We expanded our date range to 1871 to cover the period of the assassination of Octavius Caddo. And we added two more partners, the American Theological Library Association and the University of Pennsylvania. ATLA was going to help us with get the word out to religious scholars, and Penn was going to help us by providing long-term preservation. This time, when we submitted in 2017, we were successful. So what records did we consider scanning? Certainly sacramental registers, but also charters, deeds, correspondence, accounts, vestry minutes, and even sermons. As I mentioned earlier, we set early parameters and they were fairly um, constrained. We wanted the records of congregations established in the old historic city of Philadelphia prior to 1800. And as I mentioned earlier, Gloria Dei was the one outlier, but as one of the oldest churches in the city, we simply couldn't imagine this project without them. Philadelphia in this period covered a relatively small area. The northern boundary was Vine Street and the south, southern boundary was South Street, or as it was known then, Cedar. And um, it covered all of the land between the two rivers, the Delaware and the Schuylkill. But in essence, in um, the mid 18th century, anything west of the State House, which is now Independence Hall, was the country. And as I said, we limited it to records that were created prior to 1871. I didn't want to worry about copyright or privacy issues. So what was the significance of these records? They predate many official record keeping um, tools. They came before city directories or census records. They give us a sense through the baptismal marriage and burial records of who commemorated life events in Philadelphia. And pew rent records give us a more accurate reading of who was in the city on a regular basis. Vestry minutes reflect the social upheaval of the day. This entry is from the minutes of the United Churches of Christ Church at St. Peter's on July the 4th, 1776. Whereas the Honorable Continental Congress have resolved to declare the American colonies to be free and independent states, in consequence of which it will be proper to omit those petitions in the liturgy wherein the King of Great Britain is prayed for as inconsistent with the said declaration. Therefore resolved that it appears to this vestry to be necessary for the peace and well-being of the churches to omit the said petitions. And the rector and assistant ministers of the United Churches 
are requested in the name of the vestry and their constituents to omit such petitions as are above mentioned. Both Christ Church and St. Peter's still have their books of common prayer with those prayers struck. This no doubt was a difficult move for the rector, the Reverend Jacob Duche, and his assistants. For although Duche served as the minister to the Continental Congress, still the titular head of his church was the King of England. A year later, as others fled the city during the British occupation, Duche was under house arrest. He wrote a letter to Washington urging a reversal of course, which infuriated General Washington and subsequently the Congress to whom he sent it. Duche fled to England and was barred from returning to Philadelphia until the 1790s, a few years before his death. A few years late, later, minutes from the Second Presbyterian Church relate damage from the occupation of the city. September 24th, 1778, notice being previously given, some of the members of our congregation met to consult what was necessary to be done. The fence of our burying ground being destroyed, the pews of the church taken down, the seats removed and other damages sustained. And at Gloria Dei, the Archivum Americanum, a history of correspondence among the different Swedish parishes and churches, we learned that the church was used as a hospital. Even accounting records have their stories to tell. You see here the accounting records of St. Peter Sexton George Stokes, detailing the burials of Native American chiefs who came to visit President Washington in 1793, and sadly died of smallpox before they could return to their tribes. Legacy, chief of the Powhatamis of the Illinois River, smallpox, aged 36 years. A pot of Haya, a Pegashaw war, war chief, died of smallpox, aged 25. The guy Waitono, war chief of the Wabash Nation, smallpox, aged 52 years. Barkskin of the Pankashaw Nation, smallpox, aged 26 years. Grand Joseph, great chief of the Atono Nation of Eel Creek, smallpox, aged 63 years. Wapati, war chief of the Payagaria Nation, aged 60 years. Other entries report stillbirths, asthma, death from consumption, and more. There is a poignancy to these records, and they are treasure troves for those interested in public health. We've encountered a few surprises in these records as well. And one of those is the chattiness of some of the early records and the drama that went on. These are from the First Baptist Church meeting minutes, June the 9th, 1758. When meeting of preparation was over and the meeting of business going to be concluded by prayer, Mr. Woodrow stopped Mr. T. Davis's hands in order to propose that a meeting of business should be appointed by itself. This was seconded by J. Perkins, L. Reese, and some women very strenuously. Then Mr. Jones, Mr. Branson, Mr. J. L. and others went out, upon which John Perkins locked the door. S. Berkelo asked if they were going to be made prisoners of. S. Morgan made towards the window in order to go out and call a constable. J. Powell prevented him. Mrs. Shewell snatched the key from Perkins and opened the door. Then Mr. Woodrow remonstrated with S. Morgan for his arbitrary proceedings and bickerings ensued. T. Davis made as though he would conclude till the meeting of business should be agreed on, adding to Thomas Davis that he was the cause of much mischief. Davis leaves them. They propose to put the motion to the vote. Morgan goes out to bring Mr. Jones and Mr. Davis in. They come and put an end to the meeting, but not before the 23rd day had been fixed on, during their absence. The next day, S. Morgan refused to give the bread and wine to H. Woodrow, L. Reese, and Mrs. Woodrow, but H. Woodrow snatched the bread. Locked doors, members escaping, and the refusal of communion the next day to some of the instigators, you are unlikely to find these types of events recorded in today's minutes. 
Gloria Day's funeral records left by uh, the Reverend Khalid are absolutely fabulous for genealogists. Usually these types of records are fairly cut and dried entries, but this rector gives us the age of the deceased, the cause of death, last days, weather, and so much more. And their vestry minutes too record a great deal of drama. Here you have the 1767 account of a very public disagreement between the Reverend Charles Rangel and Andrew Bankson, formerly a vestryman of the church, which played out not only in the vestry minutes, but in the press. The entire event took up multiple pages in vestry minutes and no doubt columns of print. This latter entry summarizes the situation. To the public, the Committee of the Incorporated Swedish Churches of Wekako, King Sesse, and Upper Marion beg leave once more to address the candid public in answer to Mr. Bankson's paper of the 5th of August. The reader will please to recollect the state of our dispute with that gentleman, which is briefly this, and was not begun by us, but by Mr. Bankson himself, in a most abusive attack on the character of our minister, for no other reason but having hinted his suspicions that Mr. Bankson had not fairly settled his accounts concerning the church. Our minister made a short and modest reply to this, acknowledging that he had those suspicions and that they could only be removed by a fair and full settlement on the part of Mr. Bankson. The vestry at the same time, in a full meeting, ordered an answer to Mr. Bankson, in which they took the whole matter on themselves, declaring that it was not the doctor alone that had those suspicions, but they themselves had much reason to entertain the like suspicions, as Mr. Bankson's for 15 years, though often called on, had never there settled his account properly or to their satisfaction. A committee was then appointed to make the proper replies to Mr. Bankson if he should choose to proceed in this dispute, and it is hoped the papers we have published appeared cool and fair in the eyes of impartial readers. While Mr. Bankson, on the other hand, has been very abusive of us and our minister for adhering to our duty and discharging our trust to the congregation. Not surprisingly, Mr. Bankson soon left Gloria Dagey and switched over to St. Paul's and was buried there. I am eagerly awaiting to see if anyone can find mention of Mr. Bankson in the St. Paul's best three minutes. For an understanding of social customs and religious beliefs, we have this wonderful request from the members of Mikvah Israel for a mikvah or bathing place for the purification of married women on May 28, 1784. Sadly, this request was never granted. These records bring the past to life in vivid ways and never more so when they record truly tragic events. Here you see the assassination of Octavius Cato, a prominent African-American teacher, baseball player, and abolitionist activist, who was also active in St. Thomas's African Episcopal Church. Upon hearing of his death, the vestry came together and wrote, regarding the assassination of Octavius Cato, they called a special meeting on October 12, 1871 at the Parsonage. William Morris Brown presided and stated the object of the meeting to be to consider the death by assassination of Octavius B. Cato, a member of this vestry. After some suitable remarks by Mr. Sewell and Mr. Brown, it was moved that a committee of three be appointed to draft suitable resolutions and publish the same. Carried. Committee appointed was Cassie, Bowers, and Vidal. It being stated that William Cato Sr. designed desired to inter or designed to inter his son from Bethel Church. It was moved that William Brown and William Fennett be a committee to call on the father and represent the views and wishes of this body in relation thereto carried. Uh, ultimately, Octavius Cato was buried neither from Mother Bethel nor from St. Thomas. A four hour memorial service was held for him at the armory at Broad and Ray Streets, and he was buried at Lebanon Cemetery. No doubt they realized that the crowds would be too large for either church. Because this project lasted two years longer than anticipated thanks to the pandemic, we were fortunate enough to be able to bring the Quaker records into the project. These records from 1776 relate the use of the meeting house by provincial troops. 
The same friends being appointed to make inquiry by what means our meeting house in Market Street lately became occupied by soldiers made the following report. That on the 14th of the seventh month instant, Clement Biddle, in company with John Ladd Howell, came to the house of a friend and informed him that a number of provincial troops were coming to Philadelphia and would be here shortly. And he would quarter them in Friends Meeting House and the Presbyterian Meeting House, and that he had an order from the Congress for so doing, which he read, but did not mention the person's name who signed it. The friend let him know that if he did quarter any troops in our meeting house, it would be taken very unkind. He queried who kept the keys and was informed that friends could not deliver the keys, and that if he used it for that purpose, he must take it by force or break it open. On the 15th instant, John Ladd Howell called at the house of another friend and showed him an order signed by the deputy quartermaster, Clement Biddle, ordering said Howell and some other person to quarter some troops in the worship houses of this city, if no other places could be found, and queried of him which of our meeting houses it would be least inconvenient for friends to spare. On the 16th of the seventh month, 1776, a considerable number of provincial troops from Maryland on their march towards New York or the east part of New Jersey stopped in this city, and part of them having taken their lodging in our meeting house opposite the market house, it became the cause of concern of diverse members of this and other meetings in this city to meet together on the 17th in the evening, not only to inquire by what means they got possession of the house, but also to inquire how we should hold our usual weekday meeting. It turns out they took it by force and without consent, so they felt it was within their rights to try to hold weekly meetings at the usual place. The friends went to inform the commanding officer, William Smallwood, that they would be holding their weekly meeting the next day at the usual hour. Smallwood said he would order his soldiers away at the time of the meeting. The friends invited those who wished to stay for the meeting to do so. Smallwood admitted he was uneasy at being quartered there, quote, as there were other places which would have been more proper and convenient, end quote, that he had given positive directions to his soldiers to avoid doing any damage to the benches or otherwise. The meeting was held, a few soldiers attended, and the soldiers continued to occupy the house until the first day morning following, when they left at about the time of the gathering of the meeting. These records these of the um, Society of Friends are in the custody of Haverford and Swarthmore Colleges. Their contract with Ancestry had just expired, so we were able to harvest the scans they had done, almost doubling the size of our original project and bringing in um, a major religious influence in Philadelphia during this time. Over this past summer, um, the archivists at Haverford and Swarthmore had a student scan in an additional 50,000 records so now we can also share with the public the records of the Committee for Sufferings and the yearly meeting of women's friends. We know the records are wonderful for genealogical purposes, and you've seen a few examples of their testament to political change, but they offer opportunities for scholars in so many different areas. Changes in geographical locations with letters of transfer, expansion of the city. In early years, the Gloria Dei records refer to those living in the woods. They even record variations in weather. The ministers at Gloria Dei recorded a snow in early October of 1704, followed by a hurricane just weeks later. In 1705, there was a multitude of locusts. Even more descriptive was an earthquake whose tremors were felt on both sides of the river in 1715. David Daly, a traveling Methodist missionary, had the Eastern Shore Circuit at the turn of the 19th century. He wrote of a camp meeting on Tangier Island in 1819, which appears to have taken place in the midst of a hurricane. And if any of you have been to Tangier Island, you'll recognize that even then there weren't many opportunities or options for shelter. Friday the 27th, early in the morning, it was raining and blowing a storm from the Northeast, which continued with a few short intermissions of rain all day, the wind rather increasing, a few tents were blown down. A great many people were aboard of their vessels in the harbor, unable to get ashore. About sunset, the wind and rain had both increased so as to make it truly alarming. A few more tents fell. Sometime in the night, the wind shifted and blew from the southward as a clear sky appeared, but in the morning, it was blowing from northeast again but much more moderate than yesterday, still cloudy and rainy. 
At 8 o'clock this day, a.m., Saturday the 28th, the trumpet sounded from the stand to call the people to public prayers. Mr. Beam began by giving out a hymn, and after singing, went to prayer. Mr. Green gave an exhortation, sang, and prayed. It rained a little, but the people by this time were used to the wet. Mr. Wedwood sang, Westwood sang and prayed. David Daly did in like manner. Mr. Adelot then got in the stand and made some remarks on the dispensation of divine providence in sending this storm and encouraged the people to hope in God. A good many seemed to be much engaged and stayed to hear the singing and prayer by Mr. Idolot, even in a little rain. A good deal of uneasiness existed in the minds of many of the people on account of the situation of their vessel, which the storm had driven ashore. A great many people came on the ground this morning from on board, singing and shouting, etc., in various tents. The rain prevented preaching at 11 o'clock. At half past two, Mr. Idolot had the trumpet blown. Few people collected, but the rain immediately drove them back. Some time after, it broke off and the sun shone. The trumpet sounded. Henry White sang and prayed, sat the stand. But the wind blowing in his face, he abandoned the stand and went to the lee of a tent and preached to several thousands of anxious hearers. On these, the prize of our high calling of God in Christ Jesus. On August 31st, the meeting ended. Our tents were soon all struck. Canoes and other small crafts were loaded, conveying goods to the vessels. And when the vessels were all under sail, taking various directions, it exhibited a scenery truly grand. There were about 260 tents. These records also record the names of those who built these wonderful churches and synagogues many of them members of the Carpenters Company, including Robert Smith, who oversaw the construction of the Christ Church steeple. And here you see our steeple account books that include not only payments to people like Robert Smith, but uh, to the riggers and for rum. And one often wonders if you needed the rum before or after you climbed the steeple. Smith also oversaw construction of the Second Presbyterian Church with Gunning Bedford and later went on to design St. Peter's Church. But what I hope they ultimately will show is the interfaith cooperation that existed in Philadelphia. One of my very favorite lines is from Francis Hopkinson's account of the Grand Federal Procession of 1788, celebrating the ratification of the Constitution when he describes processing the clergy of the different Christian denominations with the rabbi of the Jews walking arm in arm. We have some terrific partners in this initiative. The American Theological Library Association, who is providing a portal for these records in their digital library and reaching more religious scholars than we could ever hope to on our own. And as I mentioned earlier, the University of Pennsylvania's Special Collections Library is providing the long term preservation of these very high resolution scans. The Athenaeum of Philadelphia has been a stalwart supporter from the beginning with their superb scanning and care of these records while in their custody to their hosting of special events and providing valuable connections for us. So where do we go from here? Transcriptions. And we're always looking for more transcribers. So please, if you'd like to join us, we would love to have you. Because the records become so much more searchable once they're transcribed. We've developed a way in which these records can be transcribed online and submitted to us for review. And our most recent efforts, particularly since the lockdown started, was to expand this project, knowing that there were people stuck at home looking for projects. I am thrilled to tell you that we have, as a result of this and some prior work, been able to post transcriptions for more than 13,000 pages. And again, as I said, we are always looking for more help. Our transcribers are really engaged in this process. Um, one of them wrote a wonderful article for her community newsletter that I wanted to share about her work with the 1793 yellow fever epidemics. There is the shock of immersion in the 1793 yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia when two, three, four burials were possible in a single day with page long records for one month with entries hasty and incomplete crammed together with cross outs and corrections 
One begins with Mrs. and ends there. Quote, a Frenchman buried as a stranger, end quote, which is a non-member of the church. Ages in one set of records, no longer recorded until the following May. The family of the Reverend Sprout dying off one after the other, after the other, after the other. The constant hurry, exhaustion, and the grief and uncertainty of the time reaches through these pages two and a half centuries later and resonates with us now. Jean Craig captured, I think, what so many of us were feeling in these very early months of the COVID pandemic, and we could relate to how our ancestors felt. We use technology to try to build an online community for these transcribers with a dedicated Facebook page and events such as our bi-weekly coffee hours, which are still going on today. We're bringing in the databases of those Christ Church records that I showed you um, we were working on earlier, as well as the Gloria Dei records, so that more names will be searchable. And we've done some public programs where we've invited scholars to speak about their use of these types of records. We've introduced the project to the historical community at the American Association of State and Local History, the American Theological and Library Association's annual meeting, and um, shared the project with members of the different congregations and the general public at various events. You can see some of these outreach initiatives on our news and updates tab at philadelphiacongregations.org. You can also see and listen to some of the scholarly programs that we've held. We were so fortunate in having a Drexel MLIS student reach out to us and ask if she could work on a capstone project. She developed lesson plans around these records. Um, and these lesson plans, which are really geared to like middle school and early high school students can be found on the resources, resources tab of our website. And one of our Christchurch educators developed a wonderful interactive digital map of early religious congregations, also available on the resources tab. You can see photographs of what places used to look like and sometimes what they look like today. Most recently, Michelle Belden, our metadata archivist, posted some blogs sharing hidden stories that these records reveal, including a fascinating tracing of African-American family connections that she found through the Christchurch records. This post and more can be found on the News and Updates tab. We held a wrap-up symposium that was open to the public. And again, those recordings can be found on our website. And here are the websites that you can visit to view these records. I don't have a handout, but truly almost everything that I've mentioned can be found on that philadelphiacongregations.org website. And to see our records in contrast with other religious um, archives, check out the Atla Digital Library. We are so very proud of this project, not least because so much of it has been undertaken with the help of volunteers. Archives are not the primary or even secondary mission of these institutions who are reliant on volunteers for the most part or someone whose job is something else altogether. So to have it come this far is terrific. The advantages to the congregations cannot be overemphasized. By scanning these records and making them available online, they reduce the need for scholars or family historians to physically come in and view the records, something that these congregations are not always equipped to handle. It provides the congregations with a preservation copy of the information and it reduces physical handling of the materials. Finally, by putting this information online and together in one unified database, more researchers will see it. Someone looking at the St. George's early records might suddenly think, oh, Gloria Dei, maybe they have something that might be helpful for me. These are by no means the records of all the early congregations. And since this project has gone live, we've heard from the custodians of others. We are continuing to scan new records, thanks to grants from the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission, which allowed us to bring in the Moravian records, as well as some additional records from the original congregation. The Connolly Foundation is supporting the scanning of Catholic records uh, from St. Mary's and Holy Trinity. And we hope to have these go up sometime this year. This was an incredible gift from CLEAR and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation to researchers of early Philadelphia history. And we could not be more grateful. And of course, we're equally grateful to our additional funders and partners who have made this possible. 
And now I will stop sharing my screen and I am happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. That was so fascinating. And we do have some questions. Great. All right. So the first one, um, someone specifically looking for a couple of different churches. So St. Michael's and Zion Lutheran in Philadelphia, they're looking for 18th century records. Um, off the top of your head, do you know? I do. Um, those records are at Lutheran Theological Seminary in Mount Airy, which is a part of Philadelphia. Uh, Lisa Monardi, I believe, is their archivist. But if you went to the Lutheran Theological Seminary website for the archives, you should be able to find it. I would love to be able to bring those records in. So if anyone has suggestions on funding this, please let me know because they're an important they they were really in a very important church in Philadelphia in the 18th century. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So it looks like is it the United Lutheran Seminary? Is it say Philadelphia? Philadelphia campus. Yeah, it, that's probably it. Seminary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. Let's see here. It's at the intersection of Germantown Avenue and Allen's Lane. Okay. And the archives are housed in the Brossman Center, B-R-O-S-S-M-A-N. Yeah, this is it. Okay. All right. I'm going to put this in the chat. I like having links to things. Absolutely. All right. So also, if you guys want to request a copy of the chat so you have the links on hand, please feel free to email us at genealogy at acpl.info, and we will be happy to send that to you. Um, okay, so someone else actually said uh, they were asking about Lutheran churches in 1770 and later. Again, same. Well, the Lutheran churches would have been St. Michael and Zion, and of course, Gloria Dei in those days was Swedish Lutheran. Um, it became an Episcopal, part of the Episcopal uh, diocese, I believe somewhere like the 1840s, 30s, somewhere around there. Awesome. Okay. And then let's see here. Uh, someone has an ancestor married by a Lutheran pastor in 1910. The pastor was spell spelling, probably not correct, mayor. Um, so following up on that, the Lutheran, again, same. Right. Archive. And some of those records have been published. I'm just not sure which ones. And of course, you know, it's interesting because when we looked at some of the Christ Church published records, that were done maybe in the 1930s or even all the way back probably in the 1880s. It was really interesting because I wasn't sure, if, okay, they're published, maybe I don't need to put the originals up, but yes, you, we did because we discovered that at least with our records, um, the marriages must have been taken from the WPA books and they all went alphabetically. So if you didn't have a last name, they, it would not have included you. And that's kind of an interesting piece. So that's one of the really critical reasons, I think, for getting these original records out, that it sh shares more stories of underrepresented people. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, so someone's asking specifically, when are the Catholic records going to be online? I hope they'll be up later this year. They have not been scanned yet. At the moment, all St. Joseph's Roman Catholic Church records are online. Uh, for better or worse, they are in Latin. So again, we not only need transcribers, we could use a few translators. Fair enough. Well, as researchers, we know to use those genealogical word lists uh, from Family Search. Yeah. So that's fantastic. Okay. Um, oh, someone was asking what the two Catholic congregations were. Well, the two that we hope to be bringing in are St. Mary's and Holy Trinity. So St. Mary's, I think, was established around 1760 and Holy Trinity in 1795. It was the first Catholic church for German-speaking people in Pennsylvania. That would be fantastic. All right. So how do you find old church records from churches throughout Pennsylvania? So uh, their ancestors were held responsible responsible for helping build a reformed church in Hempfield around 1800. The minister kept a record of the births and baptisms. The records were eventually transcribed from German to English, but prior to this time, the family was in Berks County. Any thoughts? 
you know, it's so hard to tell because church records in some denominations, once a parish closes, the records are transferred, like with the Episcopal uh, Diocese in Pennsylvania, if a parish closes, those records are transferred to the archives. At the Presbyterian Historical Society, they'll take the records of any Presbyterian church that wants to send them to them. Um, but of course, as you all know, some of these records are probably still in people's attics, if we're lucky, and some of them may not have survived. So um, I would try the local historical societies. I would try the local um, diocesan archives. Sometimes they have lists. I know like with the Episcopal Diocesan Archives, they have a whole list of close church or churches whose records they hold throughout Pennsylvania. Great advice. Thank you. Uh, someone's asking, is it common for the Quaker marriages to be entered in the Gloria Dei records? I found an ancestor there. No, it is not. <laughs> and I wonder if that ancestor uh, remained in meeting or was read out of meeting for it, because I, I didn't think the Quakers really took very kindly to marrying outside of meeting. Uh, but you could also try to check those original, those Quaker records, because we have, as you know, we have about 100,000 of them to see if you can find a record of a marriage for that ancestor within the Quaker records, too. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So my ancestors were married in what the record called Old First Reformed Church. What is that? What church is that? I think, and but please don't hold me to this. I think it was probably like a congregational church, and it is at the quarter of Fourth and Race, and those records are at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. Nice, very good. Um, how much of Swarthmore's Quaker records have you scanned? Are they all transcribed? Practically none of them are transcribed, which is why we're so desperate for transcribers. So please. Feel free to click on that help us transcribe tab. No, um, we have, well, we pr pretty much have 100,000 pages of records. And as I said, you know, maybe, I don't know, a few hundred pages are transcribed. So we're desperate for more help with those records. Thank you. Any suggestions on finding pre-Revolutionary War Scots-Irish Presbyterian records? Well, I would assume that they would be part of the Presbyterian churches then, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, and I would start with Presbyterian Historical Society and ask them or, you know, sort of troll that website and just see what information you can find there. Or then maybe call some of their research librarians and ask them for recommendations. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And... Other than Google, is there a good place that you would recommend to find some of these congregations, like to contact? I guess if you knew that you were looking within a specific denomination, whether it would be Episcopalian or Lutheran or Methodist or whatever, you could contact the organization that holds the overall archival records. So like the um, Episcopal the archives are nationally based in Austin, Texas. Um, I think with the Catholic records, they're probably more um, centralized, though, within each within the various dioceses. Awesome, thank you. Um, it looks like we have sped through the questions. Thank you so much. And people are giving some really nice suggestions in the chat as well for different things. So thank you guys. Like I said, sharing and collaborating is what we are all about. So using that chat to do that is fantastic. Thank you. Um, so I think we are going to go ahead and end. So thank you so much, Carol, for a wonderful presentation. And thank you all for joining us today. If you guys would like a copy of the chat, please email us, genealogy at acpl.info, and hopefully we see you for our next program on Tuesday. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you.